I want to share a secret with you, or at least my idea of what the secret was behind the extraordinary musical instruments that were made by Antonio Stradivari and a few of his contemporaries in the 17th and 18th centuries in Italy. And it wasn't that he put the blood of his dead wife into his varnish or that he boiled his wood in toad's piss while reciting ancient texts under a full moon. No, it, it was much simpler than that. Now, some of these old stories may turn out to be true, and we love those old stories. But that is not what made these people capable of making these wonderful instruments. The secret, I think, probably, is that these people were profoundly talented, and they lived in an age where all kinds of different disciplines were merged together in a pool of intense creativity. Much like today, where uh, uh, cross-disciplinary work is everywhere, in our own modern uh, renaissance. The enigma of a fine violin tone is laced with debate, and it's, all the time it's represented wrongly in the media. And due to the scarcity of these instruments and the exorbitant price tags that they have, um, people's idea about real value has been compromised. Now, I make violins, violas, cellos, and double basses strictly in the traditional way. I'm actually also very interested in the acoustic uh, research involved in getting to know what these instruments are all about. So I began um, taking part in meetings of scientists and musical instrument makers, first in Oberlin in the US and then in Cambridge in the UK. Initially, there was a huge gap in the language that these two groups used, and the violin makers had a hard time understanding the terminology used in the, in the laboratory. And the scientists found the descriptions used by the instrument makers very subjective, to say the least. I'd like to introduce uh, the first series of um, electric uh, stringed instruments that have a built-in convolution engine, which is using digital signal processing to emulate the tone of really, really fine instruments. And in collaboration with a company called Signal Wizard, uh, in the UK and Manchester University, we've managed to make an instrument that has extremely fine tonal characteristics and getting ever closer to those really fine instruments. And it involves uh, a very precise measurement of violins, violas, cellos and double basses and the development of a software hardware suite that is able to take the recorded sound of these instruments and produce a copy of it in real time. Now, an electric violin usually, a, a purely electric violin, can sound rather dull. Although it has to be said that, you know, a talented musician can exploit that electric sound to great effect. But our team has managed to make an instrument that is quasi-indistinguishable from a really fine violin. I say quasi-indistinguishable because a very, very talented violinist has a, a very, very developed sense of tone and playability. So I've collaborated with uh, Professor Patrick Gedetsky at uh, the University of Manchester in creating a platform using digital signal processing and psychoacoustic evaluation, along with measurements of the really the finest instruments in the world. And the technique involved is uh, using a very sensitive force hammer and hitting the bridge of the instrument, recording that sound, creating a, a, uh, an acoustic file from that, and then using that file as the basis for a digital filter. That digital filter is then downloaded onto the device. Now, the hardware and the software uh, needed to make this happen, which has been developed by Patrick Gadetsky, um, comes in the form of V-Sound, which is a, 
a kind of an off-board uh, digital stomp box pedal, which can be used with existing electric instruments. And then also D-Cello, which is a similar circuit, which is embedded into some of my uh, electric, custom-made electric instruments. I've been using my experience as a violin maker to gain access to and measure some of the finest instruments that I can get my hands on using the methodologies and the techniques that I've learned through my interaction with uh, the scientific community. One of the drawbacks of playing even the finest digital emulation of a violin through an, a, a conventional loudspeaker is that the conventional loudspeaker lacks a kind of a spatial embodiment that you hear when you play a, a, a fine violin in a good acoustic space. And that's because the violin, because of the way it's shaped, and the way it vibrates, it throws the sound in different directions at different frequencies into the space. So, for example, when you play a really high-pitched tone on a violin, the sound projected from the instrument will be directed in specific directions, whereas if you play the lowest note of that instrument, it will be dispersed more or less evenly through the space. And what this means is that the sound that's coming from the instrument, will be bouncing off the walls and the ceilings and the floor, uh, totally contingent on the way that the instrument is played. So one of the things that we're researching also is uh, a method to be able to recreate this using omnidirectional speakers. One of the most valuable aspects of this project, uh, not only for me as a violin maker, but also for the, the whole stringed instrument cultural community, is to harvest what can best be described as a fingerprint or a sonic fingerprint of these fine instruments by, and, and then making a database of files, each of which will be used to characterize that instrument for posterity. Just think of the uh, Svalbard Global Seed Vault up in Spitsbergen, where a whole variety of plant seeds are preserved as spare copies of plant seeds from seed banks from all over the world. Well, if a priceless Stradivari violin is destroyed, its sonic characteristics can be preserved in much the same way. But it must be stressed that a recording of a particular performance on a particular violin is, in essence, not the same thing as this sonic fring fingerprint. Because what this technique does, it puts the tone at the fingertips of any player. Now, tone is not the same thing as its graphical representation. The spectral plot of a cello is not the same thing as when somebody manages to make a cello sing a beautiful musical phrase. We mustn't confuse acoustics with tone. Acoustics is a physical language, consisting of physical data. Tone is more of an aesthetic uh, and has more to do with art. Acoustics is an intellectual pursuit. Tone is more of a, an intuitive experience. The legendary violinist Yasha Heifetz uh, was approached by a woman once backstage after a concert where she said, Ah, oh, Mr. Heifetz, your violin sounds wonderful. To which he pre replied, and he put the violin up to his ear, and he said, Funny, I can't hear a thing. <laughs> and so what is it that, that fascinates people about string tone? Well, the Heifetz story reminds us that it's a conglomerate of many, many things. One obviously the talent of the performer, two, the mindset of the people listening, and three, the uh, nature of the acoustic space where the performance takes place. So some of my colleagues have been doing comparative research on comparing old violins to new violins. Um, and the results of these tests and exp uh, experiments um, have... Um, are a critical evaluation of violin tone, but also gives us the knowledge needed to make better and better new instruments. Now, I'm not particularly interested in the, uh, in the debate of old violins versus new violins, 
But I'm fascinated by the prospect of being able to make a great instrument based on hard knowledge on top of the age-old tradition that I've been lucky enough to inherit. Now you might ask, why do this? Why, why not? What, what's wrong with a normal violin? It doesn't need a USB cable. But for me personally, it's a, it's a way to learn something new about violin tone in a very non-trivial way and to deepen my understanding of this wooden box and the way it behaves and how I can make it a better tool to make a musician be able to realize a better performance. Off and on, and recently, I've had the feeling that I need to get away from measurements and technology and just to feel how it, what it feels like to cut with a sharp gouge through a piece of wood or to use my teeth on biting the wood to, to ascertain the density of it and to use my sense of smell and my sense of hearing and to experience that magic and art that makes violin making almost an esoteric pursuit in the hope that there's somewhere a realm where these two seemingly incongruous approaches can merge and great things can be done and great instruments can be made. Now, a, a very, very good violinist can still tell the difference between a real violin and a digital emulation of that violin, according to a recent study that we've done, but not by a great statistical margin. So we're hoping that with continued research, we'll, there's work to be done. Now, I'm going to leave you with uh, a short musical phrase played on a purely electric violin with no re sounding body, followed by that same recording, the same uh, playing on the electric violin, but through this digital emulation and the, the hardware that, that comes with it. And, uh, now, I'm going to play this again, but I'd like you to just uh, listen very carefully, and you can, you can almost hear in the processed version of the sound, you can almost hear the wood and the air of the original instrument that was measured. So let's go again. Thank you very much.